Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy X Stories. Right after this intro an ad will play, I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. So, to preface this, I was young, maybe 18 and 19, and I had no idea what we were getting into. So, my father owns three businesses and was actively dating his business partner and was providing for her. She also made advances on me, which kind of creeped me out. She would buy us all food, and at first I was grateful, but then I started becoming nervous as she wanted to be alone with me a lot. My father ended up getting married but didn't tell her and she got really upset at him and told me not to tell her. She came to my job and demanded to see my father to which I told her he wasn't here. She screamed at me and said we would soon regret it. Due to that disturbing nature of a statement, I called the cops and all they did was take my name but didn't actually look into it. So, fast forward. I come home at around midnight as I had just came from my second job, dead tired from school and work. I ate and crashed on my bed. It had to be at least three in the morning when I heard my door open. At first I didn't move because I assumed it was my calico cat Misty pawing at my door as she liked to sleep with me. When I groaned her name and she didn't answer, it struck me strange, but I wasn't worried until I felt a presence standing over me. I quickly woke up and discovered my father's ex in our house above me, crazy-eyed. She was screaming, saying how she would get her revenge on my father. I quickly rode out of bed, ran past her, and called the authorities. She openly tried to fight my father's wife and tried to stab my father. The police came and arrested her on the spot, that was the scariest shit I've ever been through, and I'm glad I won't see her again. Now I sleep with a blade next to my bed and a taser. Please be careful, as you never know who may be up late at night waiting to pay you a visit. So, I met this guy online recently that seemed sweet and kind. I decided to set up a date on Friday, and everything is going well. That is, until yesterday. I get a message telling me that he wants to hang out tomorrow morning, and I agree, thinking that we would just go out for Starbucks and he'd come around that time we agreed to. I go to sleep with a smile on my face. Instead, I wake up to a phone call at around 8 a.m. Surprised, I answered it, and it's my date. Hey, are you up yet? Ugh, I just woke up. I don't care how you look. Also, your mom freaked me out. Wh what? My mom? Yeah, she saw me parked across your house. She waved and I waved back. She was kind of creepy. But what time did you come over here? 5.30 a.m. My heart sinks. I had no idea that someone I was casually meeting for coffee would show up super early to my house and wait for me to wake up. After the phone call, I check my messages. I see messages from 5 in the morning, a picture of my house with the message, Do you live here? The next message, he says, Someone spotted me, so I moved, along with a picture of a neighbor's house nearby. Obviously, I was freaked out and knew that my mother and neighbors were probably equally just as freaked out. I started panicking and texting my friends on my phone, desperate to see if anyone was awake and could help at all. 
I get one reply on a group chat, but out of fear of judgment, I lie to her, saying I got the situation handled. I convince myself to go out and confront this guy. Hi, princess. How are you? I noticed him on my neighbor's yard, probably trying to look for me in their windows. Shaking, I try to fake a smile and let him hug me. He then goes in for a kiss, wet, messy, and with tongue. I felt frozen on what to do. I tried to tell him that coming at 5 a.m. to wait for me isn't a cool thing to do. But he gives me the excuse that he wanted to beat traffic and not drive sleepy as he works nights. I try to see things from his perspective and shake it off. I go off into his car, and he and I try to have something close to a regular date, which usually doesn't include groping, licking my neck multiple times, and talking about marriage right away so I could have his baby. I manage to convince him to drop me off away from home and let me walk back to my house. That is, until I realized he was still following me in his car. And when I ask about it, he asked if I wanted him to walk me to my house. Even more scared, I tell him no and manage to escape. By the time I arrive home, I'm in tears and extremely shaky. I text him that I don't think we're compatible and to never come near me or my family ever again. In response, he tells me that I'm shit. From that, I think I'm gonna take a break from online dating. I'm going to warn you now, this story is a bit long and quite a doozy. Grab some popcorn and perk up those ears. This happened about six years ago. I'm 27 now. Having said that, I apologize if there are small details missing or that I don't remember. I had gotten out of a three-year relationship that didn't end particularly well. I didn't want to be one of those girls that made her way through a friend group, if you catch my drift. I wanted a change of scenery. I decided to try my luck on a dating site called OkCupid. I know, I know, terrible idea. I'm well aware of that now, but hindsight is always 2020. In my mind, most of the dating sites are a cesspool of incels, catfish, or desperate people. To my surprise, I actually went on several decent dates. No red flags, creeper vibes, or weird feelings. Luckily, I made my mom aware of what I was doing, so whenever I'd go on a date, she'd know where I was and when I was going to be home. Mama didn't raise no idiot, right? Wrong. This is when I came across Dennis's profile. He seemed chill, kind of cute, and somewhat interesting. So I sent him a message. He was playful and had a sarcastic sense of humor, which is right up my alley. I decided to give him a shot. We met at a coffee shop and had some very engaging and interesting conversation. Dennis was 5'9", normal build, balding with reddish hair and glasses. He definitely gave off some nerd vibes. He started off by asking, what are you looking for? I gave my normal response. I'm wanting someone who is sweet and caring, but also funny and intelligent. Something along those lines. Nothing groundbreaking. Cut me some slack. I was young, people. I realized later that giving this sort of response was the beginning of the end. Dennis and I went on a couple more dates that were unmemorable. I started to fall head over heels for this guy, and pretty fast. He was sweet, understanding, caring empathetic, worked out, and took care of himself. He was everything I ever wanted in a guy. It was difficult to understand why he was single. Since I was falling for him so quickly, we agreed that we would be exclusive. Everything was going smoothly until about two months into our relationship. That's when shit started to hit the fan. For the last month, I had been pushing him to let me hang out at his place and to meet his roommate from the suggestion of my parents because they're smart people. Every time I'd push the subject, he'd always make up some excuse on why he can't. 
My roommate is crazy. It's not a good time for him. He works opposite schedules than me, etc. It was always something. At some point, we had made plans to go out to a club one evening. I was all dressed and ready to go, waiting on him. He ended up not answering his phone for a couple of hours. I realized his phone must have died since whenever I would send him a message, it would never say delivered for those of you that are Apple users. I ended up deciding to go to his place to see if he would answer the door. I obtained his address at some point, I just don't remember how. He lived about 15 minutes from me in an apartment complex and it was the middle of winter, February. It was fucking cold outside. I knocked on his door, no answer. While heading back to my car, look who decided to show up. None other than Dennis himself. And guess who he was with? Yes, you're correct. Another woman, which I later found out was his longtime girlfriend, Jessica. I quickly made my way over to him and the look on his face was fucking priceless. His face deadpanned as soon as he saw me. He whispered something to the girl he was with and she made her way inside. He came over to me and was speechless at first. I'm, I'm very surprised to see you here. Really? We had plans, remember? I wanted to see if you were home. I do remember. My phone died so I didn't receive any of your texts and I just lost track of time. We were at a friend's birthday party. Who's the girl? My, my roommate? I thought your roommate was a guy. <laughs> he is. She's, she's my other roommate and a very good friend. Mind you, I'm a very skeptical person, and alarm bells were definitely going off in my mind, in accordance with my parents' numerous warnings. However, Dennis is the sort of person who is very good at talking himself out of situations, his reasoning behind the decisions he makes, why he made them, etc. He was an excellent liar, and being the naive and insecure person I was, I believed him. We ended up going to the club after I waited for him outside in my car for almost an hour. I didn't think about it too much since I was getting what I wanted and nothing was said about this girl roommate. Over the next month, I kept pushing Dennis to meet his family and his guy roommate. He eventually caved and brought me to see his mother. It was an extremely odd experience. We talked about books and some of Dennis's friends and I made some snide remark about how Dennis's guy roommate was fucking nuts. Dennis's words, not mine. And they both gave me the strangest glances. This would make more sense to me in about a month or so. Eventually, I started to realize that Dennis's stories weren't adding up, and I started to see holes in his stories. He would only see me on Tuesday and Thursday evenings because he worked a lot of overtime. He would never be flexible or change his mind, or even allow me to attempt to change his mind. If he was late coming to see me, which started to happen pretty frequently, he would send me screenshots of his work and his work vehicle in line for getting a wash, or he would send me screenshots of his bathroom saying he just wanted to freshen up. When I would ask for a picture of him in that moment of him in his bathroom mirror, he declined. He refused to send any pictures of himself, proving that he was where he claimed to be. He would also take unusually long bathroom breaks at my house after sex. I'm saying like 20 or more minutes long breaks. I know another huge alarm bell. Everything came to head about a month or so later. I told Dennis that I wanted us to go somewhere with no phone service so that we could truly spend time together without technology being a distraction. He agreed. We ended up making plans to spend two to three days in Canada. It was still early in our relationship, four months at this point, and my mom wanted to make sure I was safe, so she took down Dennis's driver's license and made a copy of it as well. She also took down his license plate information. Thank you, Mom. The trip ended up relatively uneventful until the last evening in the hotel room. I'm not sure if it was on purpose or if he was actually asleep. Dennis ended up rolling over to my side, pulling me in close and saying, 
I love you, Jessica. That made my blood run cold. I was freaking upset. Tears started to blur my vision as I got up out of the bed. My parents were right all along. He was a liar and a cheater. Did I break it off? No, of course not. That would make sense. Why I was naive and desperately in love with this dude. I also didn't want to admit it to myself that I had been played or that I was the side check. So I acted as if nothing was wrong and that I didn't hear what he said that night. Of course, it didn't get rid of the aching feeling that I had for several weeks. I began to have bad anxiety and panic attacks on my way to school because of the bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Dennis was constantly lying to me, and I do mean constant. It was so bad that I ended up starting to feel angry. I let that feeling simmer for a couple of days until I decided to do something about it. When realizing that you were right all along and things weren't just a strange coincidence, it's very bittersweet. On a freezing March day, after an exhausting day at school, I wanted to get rid of that nagging feeling in the back of my mind once and for all. I decided to head for Dennis's apartment complex to see if he was still lying to me about living in the apartments with his girl roommate. I got out of my car and the parking lot. I was shaking. I didn't know if it was from anxiety or from anger that was starting to bubble below the surface. Was he lying about this girl roommate? You bet your sweet ass he was. I knocked on his door and hid myself from the view of the peephole. He answered the door with his girl roommate behind him. I came from around the corner to look at him with an emotionless face and say, <laughs> Wow. I turned on my heels and walked away, only to find out as I get back to my car that I locked myself out of my car on a cold March day in the middle of fucking winter. I was so distracted by my rage and sadness that I didn't realize I left both my keys and phone in the car. I'm such an idiot. I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. I locked my phone in the car along with my keys. How the fuck can you do that? I was so angry at myself for being a fucking moron. Not only that, I was in the parking lot of my cheating ex-boyfriend's apartment complex. I wish I could make this shit up. I really do. With nothing else to lose, literally, I walked back to Dennis's apartment and knocked on their door. Jessica answers and I beg to use their phone to call AAA. Jessica surprisingly agrees and lets me use her phone. This entire time, Dennis is agitated and kept walking around after I got off the phone with AAA. At one point, he even went outside with a coat hanger in an attempt to unlock my car, but to no avail. During that time, I took advantage of me being alone with Jessica to get some information out of her. Like, how long have they been together? Where did they meet? I felt as though I was an auctioneer. I was shooting 20 questions at her rapid fire before Dennis came back in. By the end of it, I had more than enough information to prove that Dennis was not who he said he was. Everything started to make sense and puzzle pieces began connecting. One of the biggest aha moments for me was when we both were talking about being in a relationship with him on Facebook. It turns out this sly motherfucker created two different Facebook accounts to ensure he was in a relationship with us both on each of them, only to block the other girl on that account guaranteeing that neither of us would come across each other or his other Facebook account. I remember in the beginning, I commented on how his Facebook profile was super limited and didn't have anything on it. He claimed it was only because he used Facebook to befriend coworkers on it and didn't use it much. Anyway, near the end of our conversation, I tried convincing Jessica that Dennis was a pathological liar and didn't care about her. It was at this point, I realized that Jessica could have been aware of everything that Dennis was doing and was in on it, or she was just that naive. I tried texting her after I had left their apartment to try and talk some more sense into her, but it was useless. 
Dennis was with her, alone, and was a master at skewing and spinning stories. Unfortunately for him, I had one more trick up my sleeve. Over the course of the next week, I spent my remaining few free hours I had, if I wasn't studying or working, gathering evidence against Dennis. I did research on Dennis and Jessica through Google, but mostly Facebook. This is the scary part about Facebook. If you don't have your privacy settings on lock, I found out who Jessica's parents were and decided to send them a message through Facebook with all of the evidence I had collected over the past week and a half against Dennis, ensuring that they would believe me in my story. When I say evidence, I mean photos of him and I, screenshots of conversations we had through text, pictures of him and I, etc. All of these pictures, texts, conversations, having timestamps to show that he was seeing me at the same time he was seeing Jessica, hoping they wouldn't write me off as some crazy ex-girlfriend or some psycho. Wishful thinking, right? The message is long, so grab your second bucket of popcorn. I have copied it verbatim from the original post that I sent several years ago. I have changed some information to protect my privacy and the privacy of others. Hello, insert Jessica's mom's name here. My name is X, and I thought there was something you should know. Your daughter is being lied to by her current boyfriend, Dennis. I met him on an online dating site named OkCupid, and we spent the last five months together. But Dennis ended up lying to me about his life and everything about it. I doubt your daughter knows the extent to which she was being lied to. I feel it is only right for me to share the information I have collected with you, so that it may be brought to your daughter's attention and so he can no longer get away with this type of behavior. Dennis is not who he says he is, or appears to be, and has lied about many aspects of his life. Let me explain. Okay, side note. For most of the information I give you today, I also have pictures as evidence, and for your convenience to back up what I have to say. I will mention each time when a picture can be paired with information provided. First and foremost, a breakdown of the Dennis that I learned about while dating him for five months. His full name, Dennis, middle name, then last name. Phone number, redacted. Address, redacted. Dennis's mother's address, redacted. Workplace, redacted. Includes details of his work schedule, as well as him working alternate weekends. Exact vehicle description with disgusting features, redacted. Two distinguishing decals on the back window. Picture was provided for that one. License plate number, redacted. As stated previously, I met Dennis on OkCupid, an online dating site in early November. His online name was redacted, picture provided, which is also the same online name he uses for Flickr. We dated for five months until I found out that he lied to me about his living conditions and the fact of that he also had another girlfriend, your daughter. I have several pictures showing that Dennis and I were together as a couple. I also have several Facebook accounts, pictures provided. One he called a work Facebook in which he was in a relationship with me on and another account in which he was in a relationship with your daughter. His work Facebook account no longer exists since he deleted it but I was able to take pictures of it before it was deleted to prove what I am saying. Before continuing, I should mention that I have met your daughter twice. The first time was very brief and Dennis told me that she was only a good friend. They had just gotten back from hanging out with, redacted, at Dave and Buster's for his birthday, pictures provided here. This was back in early January. The second time meeting her was for a longer period of time. This was at the beginning of March. I ended up going to Dennis's apartment to see if he was lying to me about still living at these apartments. He was. I ended up knocking on their door to find Dennis answering it and to see your daughter standing behind him. Jessica mentioned to me about how she and Dennis had been dating for almost four years. I was also made aware of another Jessica. Her name is Jessica W. He dated not too long before he started dating me. Pictures provided. 
Jessica also sent me texts mentioning that there may be a possibility of him seeing another woman aside from your daughter and Jessica. A different Jessica. Pictures provided here. I will attach several files with all of the photos I have collected. They will be in the order in which they are mentioned in this letter to you. I hope this information is of use to you, and I hope I was able to help in proving that Dennis is not who he says he is, and for you not to be fooled like I was. Thank you very much for your time. Sincerely, Redacted. I did end up receiving a reply from her mother the following morning. However, this post is already long enough, and I will post the responses, if anyone is interested. The last time I heard from Dennis was a message he decided to leave in the grass in my backyard. It was a dead rabbit with his head cleanly cut from his body. It was clear a human did it, since there was no sign of blood and the head was cleanly cut off. My family and I reported it to the police in case any escalation happened. Luckily, nothing did. Unfortunately, Dennis was smart enough not to take it any further, but it was clear he was very angry. He didn't want to leave any sort of trail through internet or paper implying that he did it. Anyway, if you stuck around this long, I thank you for your time. This took quite a while for me to write since there was way more drama than what I have mentioned above, and I have no desire to relive this experience again. My method of madness is to get my story out there so that anyone reading or listening can know that your feelings are valid and to always listen to your gut. Ladies and gents, please be mindful and careful of who you become close with. The stories you hear on TV about people living two separate lives or this wasn't the person I knew are very much real and they exist right under your nose. And to Dennis, fuck you and fuck your empty apology. I feel sorry that Jessica had to deal with your dumbass as long as she did. You're only sad that you got caught. I hope karma plants you right in the ass. To all the ladies he has messed with, I hope you're okay and that he hasn't dashed too much of your confidence. He's a lowlife and that's all he'll ever be. Thank you for listening. Take care, friends, and be extremely careful. All right, dear listeners, am I crazy or did that story make her the actual crazy ex? I've never known anyone to do that. Much investigation just to catch someone in a lie. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hello. First of all, the course of events in this story happened from 2007 to 2012. However, the actual terrifying encounter in the story happened exactly in 2012, two years after my graduation. So, like others who cannot get over with their horrifying encounters, you're not alone, since that encounter still remains fresh on my mind until now. Before we start with the story, let me tell you a short history about my father and his family struggle and life in the early days as an immigrant to the U.S. My family currently lived in Pennsylvania, Lancaster to be exact, but before that, my paternal side of my father's family actually hails from Romania. They immigrated to the U.S. in 1964. My paternal grandfather fled to the West during the last days of World War II. He was not a soldier nor a collaborator during the war. Being just a regular civilian, he fled to the West due to the widespread bombings in Bucharest. He also feared of getting killed since their house was already damaged by a bomb during an air raid in 1944. Luckily, they survived. When he fled, he was already married and had one kid, who is my oldest paternal uncle. They settled and lived in France for 19 years. My paternal grandpa went into several jobs to earn money there. My dad, along with his siblings, were also born and raised there. By the time when they finally immigrated to the United States, my father was just five years old. My father was the fourth out of five children. After immigrating to the U.S., they arrived in New York, 
penniless. They experienced being homeless beggars in the streets for days until my paternal grandfather, along with his oldest son, my oldest paternal uncle, went into several jobs until they were able to make more money and rent an actual apartment. My paternal grandmother also found a job as a cleaner in various parks and usually my father, along with his two older sisters, my paternal aunt, and his younger brother, my younger paternal uncle, would come there to help her. After that, my father, along with his siblings, would study and work there for a long time. They were all able to finish primary and secondary education. To be short, they became working students during their time studying there. My dad, along with his siblings, also studied college there. They were lucky enough to finish their studies and find a stable job. My dad planned on applying as a teacher after moving to another state, since education was his course in college. Unfortunately for his younger brother, he didn't finish his education due to his vices. Instead of using his money to enroll in college, he would use it to drink it away in a bar or buy cigarettes, and the worst is he used to buy drugs. Sometimes he would even get into fights with his older siblings, including my dad, for allegedly stealing their cash to use it for his own luxury. They really feel sorry for him after their parents found out what's happening to him. They forced him to rehabilitate himself for the longest time and was only able to walk free by 1981 from the rehabilitation center. Like he promised to them, he had already changed for the better by the time he was released. Destiny also gave him a second chance. He was able to find a stable job and meet a woman who gave him all the love and time when they got married. It would take years for my father and his family to find a comfortable life. His three siblings did move to other states. However, my paternal grandfather and grandmother decided to just move to Plattsboro. My younger paternal uncle also decided to live close to them so he can keep an eye on them since they were already old. My father would finally move to Pennsylvania in 1985. His older siblings moved as early as 1983. He settled and lived in Lancaster, and he also found a job there as a school teacher. Soon after, he will meet and date my mother there until they got married. When I was a kid, Romanian language remained my first language for me to learn since I was always close with my dad. I admit I'm a daddy's boy. My mom, however, was always busy with her work as a nurse in a hospital, while my father just worked as a high school teacher. I grew up with no siblings, so honestly, I was the only child, and it was so boring for me since I don't have any younger brothers or sisters to play with or interact with. It would take several years for me to fully understand and learn how to speak English. Honestly, that was the hard part, especially during elementary. I am a total loner. I don't have any friends, and the worst part is I was ridiculed whenever I tried to speak English since I always stutter whenever I try to do it. So to be simple, I can compare myself to an alien during my childhood, a kid with no friends, a kid who was always a whipping boy, and a child who had nothing to defend himself from the judgment he would receive. But anyways, my parents were always here for me, so when I always got bullied, there would be someone who can stand up for me. I don't want to bring back all the harm on those children, but that time I just wanted to live in peace and harmony along with them, so I just ignored all the bullies. As time passed by from fourth grade to sixth grade, I was able to make some friends since my parents noted my advisor that I was having troubles communicating in English. Luckily, like a gift from heaven, my mother had a friend who was fluent in Romanian. He volunteered to translate what I was saying without asking for any payment in exchange. So he became my interpreter until I was able to fully speak and understand the English language. At least, my stress has been reduced when I was in fourth to sixth grade, since my parents explained my problem to the school authorities, so they allowed my mother's friend to translate while I was studying in school every day. My advisors every school year knew my situation. They were good and kind to me. 
My classmates also knew my problem, and they seemed to be good and humble to me as well. My bullying experiences also started to dwindle as those kids who bullied me received a hard-earned lesson from the school authorities. During that time, my parents also enrolled me in an English tutorial school. The schedule there was every weekend. I would frequently attend the school, mostly in summer. Most of the kids who attended that school were the same as me. They also could not speak or understand the English language. When I was in high school, my abilities to communicate and understand English seemed to improve very well. Now I was able to make friends easier, but I would still stutter sometimes, which would make some students laugh. But I no longer experienced bullying that much since I was a consistent honor student until I finished high school. Anyways, back to the main story. In 2007, when I was 19, I moved to Harrisburg to study college. I'll be spending four years studying there. Due to privacy reasons, I won't mention the name of the college, even though I want to. During my first month there, life was absolutely good. I lived in a dormitory along with other male students, since our dorms are separated from the girls. Our classes had many activities to deal with during the first month, so it was hard for me to have some time to talk with my parents or relax. I also felt stressed and pressured at first, but I soon realized that I will grow up and become more responsible when dealing with other activities. The campus also housed some students with strange and weird personalities. I could tell that I had several encounters with odd students. Some encounters are funny, but some are also really sketchy. But I accepted the fact that all of us in the campus had different personalities. I made a lot of friends during my first year. One of them was Terry, who became my best friend during most of the college years. Bullying is not an issue on the campus, since the system was very good there. I also started to actively participate in school clubs and extracurricular activities on the campus, a thing that would make me more socialized. When going back to my hometown and enjoying my time with my family, it only happens fully during summer. However, on spring break or holidays like Christmas break, we usually spend our time working on projects and presentations while at home. On weekends, we are not spared from every activity and assignment, so we usually spend weekends typing on laptops and researching rather than relaxing and having time with our families. In 2008, when I was a sophomore in college, I met this girl named Laura, who was recently transferred to the university. I met her when Terry and I went to the girl's dormitory as he talked with her girlfriend, Christine. By that time, Laura happens to be Christine's roommate, and they were both friends as well. During our stay there, Laura began asking me questions like, do I have a girlfriend? She also stated that she would like to date a boy like me. I can say that she's clearly into me, but my main focus by that time was my studies. I also claimed that she is only kidding that time, so I just continued to answer her questions as simple as I could without making a sign that I'm interested in her. I hadn't had a girlfriend, but I'm planning to get one after I graduated. But by that time, there was a long road ahead of me. A day passed by, and I became a topic in Laura's friend group. She apparently told her friends about me, and yes, I became a hot topic to them. Meanwhile, Terry and I decided to not yell it out loud and to just tell it in our few trusted friends group. However, as time goes by, Laura started texting me. She was able to get my number via Terry. Actually, he had my phone number since we were close friends since the first year of college. But believe me, it was upsetting at first since it was sensitive information, but I managed to accept it as my best friend provided a deep explanation for me to understand. I admit at first it was hard to talk to her. I'm busy with my studies and I don't have any interest in flirting with her. But I lately realized that I shall grab at that opportunity. As Terry told me that Laura is really serious in flirting with me, so I made a life-changing decision. 
When I texted her back, we started talking on the phone about various stuff, especially about love. After that, we started meeting in person until we started dating and officially, she became my girlfriend after several dates. During our relationship, we both exchanged questions with one another. To be exact, she asked me where I lived. I told her that I lived in Lancaster, while she told me she lived in Luzerne. It was normal since people who engage in a relationship would expect to have their hometown asked by their fellow partner. I started meeting her every day. Her calls and texts would become more prevalent than usual. She also introduced me to her friends. They seemed to like me and I was able to get along with them. As time passed by, I started to know more and more about her. However, she also started to become overprotective about our relationship and she also started to become more annoyed whenever I failed to meet her on her time. At first it was nothing since I knew that girls like her wanted a good relationship. However, as time passed by, I decided to take my time with my studies. At first she was upset, but the deeper I explained it to her, I ended up convincing her to approve my decision. Our relationship continued on the course of the college years without any conflict, but only short arguments. But everything started to get out of hand during our fourth and final year in college. She changed a lot during the final year. She became paranoid to the extreme, doubtful and envious. She would also start arguments even inside the campus, which would turn into a huge scene. It was very embarrassing for me. So one time I decided to become distant towards her and focus more on my studies. However, one night while I was studying, I heard a knock on my door, so I decided to open it. My roommate was already asleep, so I had assumed it was Terry. However, I was wrong. It was Laura standing straight in the doorway. She had that frustrated look on her face while looking at me. She began asking why I started to distance myself away from her. I explained everything to her, and that was it. She angrily left my dormitory without any words. I could even tell that she didn't even listen to what I had just said. One time, I was heading to my room after the end of our last subject. I saw her inside when I entered. She was vandalizing the room, and to make matters worse, she had been writing something in big letters that said, You are going to pay for this. All over the walls, the sign was written in red. The letters almost looked drawn in blood. It creeped me out a bit. I immediately took her outside to confront her, but she started to make a scene. It only stopped when the school authorities intervened. Afterwards, I explained everything to them, and there was enough sufficient evidence that Laura got suspended for a week. My roommate and I relocated to another room in the dormitory, since our previous room was all messed up. However, the cleaners found broken glass under my bed while cleaning. Now I knew her true intentions. She was up to no good. After that, Laura started messaging me on my phone. The messages ranged from her deep explanations to profanities. She even started threatening me, which is creepy and far disturbing for me, so I had enough and I decided to block her number. But it doesn't end there. The incident really changed my perspective on Laura, but I'm thankful that I saw her true colors that shined very badly. After her suspension ended, I decided to break up with her. She didn't say any words at all, but her face looked as sick as a parrot, and she didn't show up for several more days. I did apologize to her when I broke up with her, but I also felt sorry for her, since I felt that she might be depressed. But as days passed, I saw her on campus. She continued to attend classes, however. I didn't see her being accompanied by her friends. That made me think that our breakup had also made a big impact on her friendship with her friends. However, I didn't expect that she would use social media to also take her anger out on me. One time while I was surfing Facebook, I saw a post from Laura that showed my pictures. The post's captions had profanities. Those were intended to insult me and defame me, so I had had enough. I reported the post and blocked her on Facebook. 
I already had enough with her immaturity and malevolent nature, so I did the right thing. After our breakup, I gained the courage to talk to Terry and my friends. I decided to reconcile with them. Our relationship as brothers started to deteriorate when I was dating Laura, so I apologized to them. They accepted my apology and welcomed me back to the squad. One time, I decided to ask Christine about Laura. She said that she hadn't really moved on, and it made things worse. That's the reason why she requested another roommate to replace Laura. According to Christine, Laura's obsession with me caused her to be in prison in a quagmire. So to be simple, she became a prisoner of her own woes and misery. She changed a lot after the breakup. She would cry for the longest time and sometimes she would swear uncontrollably inside the room. She also became delusional after our breakup. She continued to live her fantasy while denouncing the reality. Laura had also started to show her darker side. She would get into fights with other students. She would even make threats. She also started to talk about dark and creepy stuff, which scared her friends shitless. Scratch marks also appeared on her arm, which made her friends speculate that she is going to kill herself at any time. So they comforted her, but it didn't help since she also became violent. She started throwing her objects violently and she would even harass Christine and her friends. This caused them to distance away from Laura. Those things shocked me a lot. I expected that she will realize her wrongdoings and change for the best, but I was wrong. She changed for the worst. Afterwards, I didn't hear much about Laura. She didn't try to talk to me. In fact, she was always alone. She didn't even apologize to her friends, and it looked like that she doesn't have any interest in having friends anymore. Months passed by, and I finally graduated. I was able to erase those bad memories in my mind and move on. After graduation, I decided to go back to Lancaster, where I would start my new life. Most of my friends who lived in Harrisburg went on to enjoy their new life by partying while others went on vacation. My other friends who lived outside the city, meanwhile, returned back to their hometowns where they celebrated their achievement with their families. All of them would celebrate before they would go on and find a good job. Christine moved in with Terry, so they both lived under one roof in the suburbs of Harrisburg. I stayed in contact with my friends. However, I didn't receive any news about Laura. I expect her to change and finally move on. Meanwhile, after summer, I went into a job hunting spree like other graduates did. I was lucky enough to find a stable job in my hometown. The salary was good. My fellow coworkers are friendly. My boss is not a jerk and I easily got promoted due to my skills. I also decided to move out of my parents' house as I bought a new house to live independently. I really expected my life would be peaceful now. Laura's past actions was not a big concern for me at the moment. I already planned on facing the future and not reversing to the past, and I moved on. However, my expectations for a peaceful life was wrong. That doesn't end there. One evening, after a long, stressful day at work, I was driving back to my home when I received a call from an unknown number. When I picked it up, there was just this breathing sound on the other end. So I hung up since I knew it was just a prank caller. However, when I was already at home, the number would not stop calling, only for me to hear the same breathing sound on the other end every time I answered. I then finally blocked the number and went to sleep. That morning, I saw something in the mailbox outside my house. The mail contains these words. I don't forgive and I don't forget, written in red. That reminded me of what Laura wrote on the walls of our college dormitory, but I threw it in the garbage since I knew it was just some prank from some kids. One afternoon, since my shift had already ended, I decided to go home. However, before I could even park my car in my garage, I saw the mail at the top of my mailbox, but this time it said, you can't run. You can hide, and you cannot escape. Written in red again. 
I decided to ask my neighbor about that mail in my mailbox. He said that he saw a car hours ago pulling over on the side of the road directly in front of my house. Then he saw a girl get out and place that mail on the top of my mailbox. That's when my heart dropped. That night, I had so many questions. I knew it was Laura, but how could she know where I lived? My mind is just full of questions. That's when I received a call from a random number. I picked it up and I heard a familiar voice saying, Go outside. I have a gift for you. That's when the shock set in. It was Laura telling me to go out, but how could she possibly trace where I lived? That was my biggest question at that time. I took a deep breath and went outside, yelling for her to show up. But I was greeted by an eerie silence. Not a single car or a person passed by in the street. But then I heard glass shattering behind me. When I looked back, I saw my front window broken. I was very angry at that point. I knew it was Laura, and I'm ready to confront her without knowing the dangers that she brings with her. I can't see anything, so I decided to check my window. As I went to go inside my house, a rock hit me in the head. It nearly knocked me unconscious. That didn't stop there, though. There were rocks hitting me from all angles. It came from the woods, which is very close and parallel to my house. I got seriously hurt, so I dashed towards the front door and slammed it shut. Then I saw pieces of broken glass on the floor. A brick was laying there. It had a sign on it saying, You made the wrong choice. I had enough, and I called the police and explained the whole situation to them. Before the police arrived, I decided to take a peek to know if it was Laura or not out in those woods. So I slowly opened my door, since it had no peephole. But I was shocked when a brick suddenly landed on my front porch. I then shut the door and waited for eternity for the police to show up. The police actually quickly arrived. I heard them yelling at someone. I peeked through the broken window to see the officers storming through the woods since my house was the very last on the block and the place is surrounded by trees. After minutes and minutes of waiting, the officers knocked on my door. I immediately opened it. They told me that they saw someone behind a tree near the side street before they got out of the car. The person is wearing all black. They also dashed back to the woods when the officers yelled at them. As they chased them, they ended up not finding the person. I told them exactly about my speculations about the person, but they said they cannot just arrest someone without proper evidence. It was also hard for them to identify whether it was Laura or another person, since the person they saw was wearing all black. I gave the brick with a sign to the officers so they can turn it into evidence. After that, they told me to call them if something else happens, and then they left. The next few days, nothing happened until one Friday night, while I was watching TV. I heard a hard thud coming from my front door. It sounded like a rock, so I decided to open the door for me to see another brick with a sign on it. The sign said, I can see you. That creeped me out, and when I looked at the street, there was this white SUV parked directly across from me, parallel to my house. I had had enough of this, so I decided to confront whoever was there. But when I looked inside, the SUV was blurred, so I couldn't make out who was in there, or if it was Laura, or just another person. I decided to go back inside and close the door. I began getting tired, so I went upstairs to my bedroom, and I fell asleep shortly thereafter. I woke up at about 2.15 a.m. in the morning. Strangely, the power had went out. So my aircon is turned off, and it was hot. So I investigated to see if there was a blackout, but there isn't any, as my neighbor's house was lit up downstairs. Now, there must be someone who turned off the power switch that is in my basement. When I went out, it was very dark at all corners by that time. So I fetched my flashlight. As I went downstairs, I saw that both front door and back doors are closed. So I went to the basement. My basement had a door outside, however it has no lock, 
so anyone could have broken in and turned the power off. It must be an intruder, were my first thoughts, but my gut was telling me it was Laura, since I already knew that it was her behind all that mail, phone calls, and the throwing of bricks. As I went down to the basement, I turned the power back on. Now that I could see around in the basement, I could also see someone hiding behind the boxes. After I could see who it was, my heart dropped. It was Laura. She was wearing a white dress. Her face was unrecognizable since it had bruises all over it. Her skin is pale white, and she looked like that little creepy girl from the movie The Ring. She is not that Laura that I met in college, but she has become something worse. My heart began racing as she smiled and asked in a persuading voice, I wanted to be with you again. Can we? I then aggressively yelled, Hell no, get the fuck out of my house. I'm going to call the cops now. She stood and started walking towards me with the sinister glare in her eyes that pierced my very soul. She then pulled an item that was behind her back. It was a gun, and she tossed one box onto the floor, only for me to see her deranged obsession with me. It was all pictures of me in college scattered all over the ground. She said that she intentionally brought all of these along with her to the basement. She also admitted into breaking into my room several times while I was in college. She then took one picture, and it was the picture of me sleeping in my room in the dormitory. She showed it to me and said in a kidding type of voice, You are such a handsome guy, but you wasted such a beautiful diamond like me, so I'm going to make sure that your life is going to be a waste. She then tore the picture up into pieces and aimed a gun at me. I fell to the ground just in time she had fired. I surely hope that woke up my neighbors. While she stood there fiddling with the gun, I dashed upstairs and tried to lock the basement door, only to fail. She fired another shot at the door. It almost hit me, so I left it wide open as I quickly dashed away from the door. I got back in my bedroom and locked the door behind me and hid in my closet. At first, I thought I heard her footsteps going room to room, but no, it was footsteps right outside my bedroom door. She tried to open the door and come in, but it was locked, so she began pounding and yelling in a frantic voice for me to open the damn door. Then there was a brief silence. That silence was broken when she broke through the door. She began searching the whole room with her gun drawn. Luckily, she passed my closet. She looked under my bed, but since the closet was behind her, I picked up my baseball bat from inside the closet, which I always use for self-defense, and took a deep breath. Thank God the doors on my closet opened silently. Luckily, she hadn't noticed me or heard anything. She was just standing there, staring at my bed like a statue. I raised the bat, and knocked her in the back of the head, which rendered her unconscious. Afterward, I then tied her up to a chair so she couldn't escape. I called the police and took her gun. The police arrived shortly after. They entered the house. By that time, Laura had started to regain consciousness. As she was coming to, she had been handcuffed by the police. She began to threaten me and even tried to attack me, but she ended up being tackled by more police officers. After that, I pressed charges against her. However, during her trial, she was declared mentally insane due to her behavior in the courtroom. This led her to be sent to a mental asylum instead. It wasn't a major concern of mine anymore since that asylum was a very strong and maximum security facility. Laura apparently had lots of mental disorders, one of them being extreme obsession and split personality, along with schizophrenia and bipolar. And that's the last that I heard from Laura. Months passed by, and I had learned that a medicated Laura finally admitted to all the chaos that she brought to me. She was then sentenced to more time in the mental asylum. Honestly, this feels like a mistake that almost killed me. Yet, I was lucky enough to have dodged that bullet. After that, I couldn't trust people easily. I had sold that house and decided to move into a place near my parents' house. I haven't heard from or about Laura after that. 
which was a good thing because I didn't care to hear anything more about her ever again. It's very far disturbing in what people can do just because of a little obsession. Okay, everyone, I'm so sorry about that story. I didn't know it was going to go on and on again. As I was reading it, I had to actually make it make sense because it was totally a grammatical nightmare. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Crazy X stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you and shout out to the reform members of the channel. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Interscare Wifey, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, CAG, Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie DW, Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.